1.4 complex numbers and 1.5 quadratic equations preparation. Okay. So first let's factor this. We're going to say 6 times negative 1 gives me negative 6. Now, since it ends in a negative, we know that they must be opposite signs. And since the middle term is a positive, the positive must be stronger. So one way that we can get a negative 6 is we can say 1 times 6. And again, since the middle term is a positive, we know this must be the positive and this must be the negative. Another way is to say 2 times 3. But again, the stronger number on the right must be positive and the weak one on the left must be negative. So we multiply those together, negative 1 times positive 6 is negative 6, and negative 2 times positive 3 is negative 6. Now, we also want to get a 1, a positive 1 coefficient, so when we add. So we're looking for when we add, we get that positive 1. So we say negative 1 plus 6 equals positive 5. That didn't work. Well, what about negative 2 plus 3? Did that work? Yes, indeed it did. We got it. When we multiply, we get a negative 6. When we add, we get a positive 1. So it looks like that worked. So let's rewrite that as r on both of these. Now, again, they're opposite signs, so I'm just going to put a plus and a minus. You can also put a minus and a plus. That'll work as well. But you do need to make sure you put the right number next to the right sign. So this is a negative 2. So you put the negative 2 there. And this is a positive 3. You need to put the positive 3 there. Next, we're going to take this negative 6, the leading coefficient, and we are going to divide both of these by negative 6. We're going to simplify. So 3 over 6 simplifies to 1 over 2, because you divide both 3 and 6 by 3. 3 divided by 3 is 1, 6 divided by 3 is 2. Next, we're going to simplify 2 over 6. You can divide both 2 and 6 by 2, and that would give me a 1 over 3. Now at this point, we can't simplify anymore, so we're going to bring it to the front. So right, that gives me a 2r plus 1. And the one on the right, I bring it to the front. That denominator of 3 gives me a 3r minus 1. Okay, let's try the next one. So now we say 12 times negative 2. So 12 times negative 2 gives me a negative 24. So we're looking for two numbers that we can multiply together, these would be a negative 24. And if you add together, we would be a negative 5. They're going to have opposite signs, and the stronger number is going to be a negative. So, we have 1 and 24. We have 2 and 12. We have 3 and 8. We have 4 and 6. Okay. And when we, we um, add them together, we want a negative 5. Now, because the middle term is a negative, we know that the stronger number on the right here must be the negative, and the weaker number on the left here must be positive. You don't have to put a positive there. By default, it's positive, obviously. So if you multiply those together, you get a negative 24. Negative 24, negative 24, negative 24. Okay, but when we add it together, 1 plus negative 20, whoops, 24 gives me a, a negative 23. That didn't work. How about a 2 plus negative 12? That gives me a negative 10. Nope. What about a 3 plus negative 8? We say that is a negative 5. Check. So we found it. Okay. So we rewrite this as z plus 3 and z minus 8. And we divide all of these by 12. Okay, so when we say 3 over 12, we divide both the numerator and the denominator by 3. That gives me a 1 over 4. And whenever we say uh, 8 over 12, we divide both of those by 4, and we get a 2 over 3. Then I can't simplify this one, so I bring the 4 to the front. That leaves me a plus 1. Over here, I can't reduce the 2 over 3, so I bring the 3 to the front. And it leaves me a negative 2. That's it. Okay, so let's try factoring a difference of squares. Now, this is just a reversal of the pattern we learned previously, right? So if I multiply two conjugates together, the same binomial but opposite signs, I get the first term squared minus the second term squared. Well, if I start with a, a term squared minus the second term squared, then I can break it apart and just go do the same pattern but in reverse, and that's what we're trying to do here. What I mean is this, see, if I can, I can take the square root of b squared and get a p, I can take the square root of 16 and get a 4, 
and its subtraction in the middle. So what I can do is I can just break this apart into p plus 4 and p minus 4. Okay. Now this one over here I can try to take the square root of x squared, and that gives me an x, and I can try to take the square root of 8. Now this doesn't really go in evenly. I mean, you can try to simplify it, you know, the two square roots of 2, but we haven't done this yet. So in this case, until we learn how to deal with the radicals, you really can't do the pattern on this one, but later on with the radicals, I mean, technically you can't do the pattern. So we're going to kind of skip over that for now. And the last one, because it's addition, even though this is a perfect square and this is a perfect square, we can't do it because this is addition and not subtraction. So this one we can't do because of, we don't really know how to do, deal with radicals right now. So this is not a perfect square, so the pattern really doesn't work very well. And this other one over here, because we're dealing with addition, you can't use the pattern on that one. So it has to be a perfect square minus a perfect square uh, until we learn how to do a little more advanced stuff. Okay, so let's try another one. Sum of squares. This is another pattern. Um, this is not quite as good a pattern in that we don't use it as often, but um, the sum of squares, we'll, we'll, we'll go over a couple of examples later. All right, so anyways, 25m squared. So if I try to take the, the square root of 25m squared, I can totally do that. The square root of 25 is 5, and the square root of m squared is just an m. How about the square root of 4? Can I do that? Yeah, the square root of 4 is a 2. So this one actually fits the pattern and its subtraction. So the three criteria, perfect square minus perfect square. So in this case, it's simply going to be a 5m plus 2 multiplied by 5m minus 2. Then we have this one over here. Uh, we try to take the square root of 49z squared. And you can take the square root of 49 that gives you a 7. You can take the square root of z squared that gives you a z. We try to take the square root of 64. We say square root of 64, which is an 8. Okay, so we add that. So it and subtraction in the middle. So this works, right? Perfect square minus perfect square. So we end up with parentheses 7z plus 8 and a 7z minus 8 instead. So we go over here. Uh, can we take a square root of 9 and x squared? We certainly can. We end up with a 3x. Can we take a square root of 4z squared? We certainly can. Square root of 4 is 2, and square root of z squared is z. So it works. And it's subtraction in the middle, right? So we end up with 3x plus 2z and 3x minus 2z. And that works. All right, square root property. Let's get into the square root property. Um, I'll just show you examples and try to try and explain all this. Basically, the point is that if x squared is equal to 16, then x is either equal to negative 14 squared, which gives me a positive 16, or positive 4 squared, which also gives me a 16. So what this would give you is, when you take the square root of both sides, you should have x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 16, which is 4. Now, sometimes I'll use this symbol just to represent it, but technically the symbol right here is the principle or, um, uh, of uh, the square root of x squared, which is the, the uh, positive one, right? So this symbol right here, technically that just refers to the positive and not the negative. If you want to get all the square roots, technically you really can't use that symbol, but it's kind of a technicality. So, so sometimes you'll see me use it just to kind of illustrate what's happening, but I know I'm using it wrong technically. Um, just be aware of that. So for instance, I'm taking the square root of both sides. It's going to be x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 5. Over here, take the square root of both sides. Do, do, do. And I end up with x is equal to... Now, this is going to be plus or minus the square root of negative 4. Um, we can't actually deal with this imaginary number, um, but normally we're not going to be dealing with this. Um, I'll, I'll just do it off to the side here, but I don't think you really need to know how to do this. But basically what this would be is negative 4 is equal to the square root of negative 1 times 4. You break this up. I'm going to do more radicals when we get to radicals, but I'll, I'm just going to give you a, a quick example. So then you break it apart into the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 4. The square root of negative 1 is an i, and the square root of 4 is a 2. So you end up with 2i. Um, but we will go into there where we get more into radicals later on, so don't feel compelled like you, you need to know this right now. You don't need to know this right now. So it'll be plus or minus uh, 2i. But we'll, we'll, do, uh, we'll do this more later when we get to radicals. So right now you, uh, you don't have to deal with that. There's no real answer to that answer. It's, a, it's an imaginary answer or complex number.
Now, let's move on to the next one. Now, you can do the same thing that we did with the first example with parentheses that are squared. So basically, you're going to take the square root of both sides. And again, technically, that's not the right symbol, but that's okay. So that gives you x minus 3 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 16, which is a 4. Okay, now at this point, I'm going to try to get the x by itself by plus 3, plus 3, cancel, cancel, and that gives me x is equal to 3 plus or minus 4. Now at this point, you need to break this part into the positive version of this, x is equal to 3 plus 4, and the negative version, x is equal to 3 minus 4. But because you can simplify further, you have to break it apart, and you have to simplify. So you end up with x is equal to 7, and you end up with x is equal to negative 1. Try the next one again, square root, square root. We know x plus 1 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 6. This one we're going to say minus 1, minus 1, cancel, cancel, we'll get the x by itself. x is equal to negative 1, plus or minus the square root of 6. This one, there's nothing you really you can do, because even if we break this apart, it will not simplify further. So you end up with square root of 6 over here, and then x is equal to negative 1, minus square root of 6 over here. Now, whenever you enter it into the, um, the answers on my math lab, they're going to want you to use set notation. So it's basically going to be negative 1 plus square root of 6, and then negative 1 minus square root of 6. So whenever you do set notation, don't put the x in there. You're just going to be putting in the answers, these two, two answers right there into there. But they're going to make you separate it. Without that, generally speaking, if you just have paper and you're doing a test or homework and you're trying to get on a pencil and paper especially, usually this is, this is a perfectly acceptable answer because even though we broke it apart, nothing would simplify further, so this is okay. Unlike the previous one where we broke it apart and we ended up with... Uh, two different answers, right? We end up with 7 and uh, the negative 1. Right, let's try the next one. Square root, square root. We end up with x plus 3 is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 9. Now, again, because we're trying to take a square root of a negative, we can't get a real answer. We are going to go into imaginary answers later on, but right now, um, there's really not much you can do about this one. So, so we get negative 3 plus or minus the square root of negative 9. Now, the square root of negative 9 is the same as the square root of negative 1 multiplied by 9, which you break apart into the square root of negative 1 multiplied by the square root of 9, which gives me i, right? Square root of negative 1 is i, and the square root of 9 is 3, and i times 3 is 3i. Now, you don't have to know how to do this yet. We're, we're going to get to that eventually, but just that's just a quick preview, right? So I know I went over that quickly, but you're not expected to know that yet, so... Oh, but just wanted a quick preview. We'll go into more detail later on. So at this point, instead of being plus or minus the square root of 9, it's going to be plus or minus the square root of 3i. So it's negative 3 plus or minus the square root of 3i. And there you go.